Okay, look, we're um, Innovation and Technology in New Zealand perspective. Um, we're going to invite um, uh, the panellists to the stage, um, and we're very fortunate to have here today Andrew Arnold, the General Manager of New Zealand for Scott Technologies, Professor Bruce MacDonald from the University of Auckland, and moderating the session is Stu Hall, who's Deputy Chief Executive of AgriSearch. I'm not actually sure how my mic's working, which is great. Um, so this session is going to follow, um, uh, we're going to have the two presentations, uh, firstly from Andrew, uh, those presentations will go for 15 to 20 minutes, then at the end hopefully we'll have time for some Q&A, so if you can keep the questions coming uh, and we'll pick them up at the end of the session, and Andrew, uh, welcome to the stage. Afternoon, but good afternoon, I'll say everybody, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Today I'm going to discuss uh, what Scott Technology has to offer the meat industry in support of sustainability and value through mechanisation and automation that we've been developing over the past few years. Um, in terms of, there's a number of industry challenges that, the, that we all understand, I think, and know. Um, the, the challenges we face. And I'm going to cover off some, how Scott is positioned to support and help the industry through some of those challenges. Just to start, Scott Technology started in the meat industry in 2000. Prior to that, we had, we've got 110 years of, uh, of um, history, um, a proud history for engineering based in Dunedin. And in 2000, our company was uh, in a position where we were having downturn in work and we needed to diversify into other industries to, to get to a point where we um, were less at risk with downturns in our prime industry at the time, which was the appliance industry. And we changed into a diversification where we geographically diversified globally, but we also went into the meat industry. We spoke to Silverfin Farms and PPCS at the time, and Stuart Burnett said, asked us why it is we can't do the automation we do in other areas of our business in the meat industry. And uh, through that discussion, we ended up partnering with Silverfin Farms and developing a vision for automated land boning. I think the key message there was that Silverfin Farms brought the meat processing expertise to the table, Scott Technology brought the automation expertise. But one of the key messages from Stuart at that time was he didn't want us coming into the, he wanted to get someone from outside of the meat industry who had really little knowledge of how, of how it was previously done and what um, automation attempts had been made. He wanted a completely new vision for how we'd go about it. So that's how we got into the joint venture with Phil Fern to develop um, automated land boning. Industry challenges, I think, as I say, we've had a lot of discussion around the challenges the industry face. Um, we suffer a lot, a lot high level of workplace injuries, strain injuries. It's very difficult to um, protect people when they're dealing with saws and knives all the time, lifting and strain injuries. In terms of industry sustainability, the critical to New Zealand economy is the meat industry. It's growing. It's um, we. It's crucial for us as a, um, as a country to continue to be successful within the uh, global markets. Uh, to be sustainable, we need to look after our people and make sure that we um, have tools to assist them and keep them safe and assist them in whatever um, they need to um, deliver a good uh, outcome. Right. Um, an example of uh, sustainability and not having the, um, not in minimising waste is if you look at what is currently done to separate the three prongs on a lamb, basically it's sawed with a saw, it takes a two millimetre slice, between one and two millimetre slice, and if you look at the boning room and how much waste there delivers over, over an um, entire year, it's equivalent to 3,000 sheep in waste alone. So automation and processing 
smart processing does offer the opportunity to reduce that. So how do we do that? <coughs> Our systems have stringent... Uh, where are we? So the video you see playing there now, that video is showing a, a mechanical aid um, with a view that taking the strain and the pull out of that particular process widens the pool of people available to do that, to, to, that task. Given the lack of labour and the challenges getting labour in the marketplace, this is a way of having longevity for staff and assisting them in just delivering the um, best possible yields but also doing the task effectively and not being injured. With automation, the labour pool, the process is fully automatic, so you don't need the people to run the day-to-day -day operation as such. Given the shortcomings in labour, the automation also generates a heartbeat of the boning range, which means downstream processes can also um, reduce the need for as many people in the boning room. And all that is an aid to, in terms of the industry attractiveness to the wider young people coming into the, um, out of universities, getting people into the meat industry as a career choice, having automation and, and these higher level um, solutions adds value. It gets people into the industry. <laughs>
this first one, the, the man's put his hand into the saw after taking the cut to push product through, and the saw is saved, and the saw stops in less than 10 milliseconds, so it's almost instant, or it is instant, and protects them should they make contact. The advanced solutions, they have, offer the opportunity with advanced sensing and um, advanced sensing, we can make much more accurate cuts. The product quality gets improved, the return from um, processes gets improved, the quality is excellent. And the example you see on this, in these images here, they are showing images of two different saddles, obviously. The one on the left shows a large eye meat and little fat and um, meat around the outside. The one on the right shows a little eye, eye with a lot of fat and uh, meat around the outside. I suppose the point with that is that automation offers the opportunity to make decisions through the process where we can say, well, if you, if you want chops, you'd be best to go to the right because it's going to give you a much heavier product regardless of the volume of meat. And the value that I've got there are just estimates, but they're an indication of how much value that could add to a process. On the left, you'll see that the decision is quite clearly, you could, you could use that for French rack, it wouldn't be a huge impact, whereas if you use it for chops, you'd lose money. But those decisions can be made by the machinery. With installation of our machines, we've learned over time that as you have a heartbeat of a room, you, your performance of your machine actually improves the performance of the efficiency of the entire boning room. So as the downstream processes get product at a constant rate, our processes have found that they can cut back on the number of staff they have in the boning room. And the machine just delivers it at the rate of one every six seconds of product. So there's been a big uplift in terms of efficiency. Uh, better utilisation of the workforce, therefore they can be reallocated to tasks and areas where they can, um, there might be bottlenecks in the process, and then obviously um, optimising the value chain. So we have, a, um, we have the ability to track our, any product coming into our system right through the entire process, and delivery of product is all, um, we know which product is coming off the machine and what product it came from through the whole chain. So if the downstream processes can control their product, um, in terms of knowing the, um, where it's come from, the supply, we can link it to the packaging and to all the, um, to all the labelling. The video you see here on the right is a good example of low-hanging fruit for the industry around reducing reliance on people and heavy lifting. This carton, this is a um, high-speed uh, layer palletizer which our uh, Europe team made. We're installing our first system currently into the um, into the industry right now in Southland. In terms of advances in automation and how Scott think we can shape the uh, industry, we've talked a lot this morning about AI and machine learning. The images you see there on the right, uh, the top, the, the um, x-rays, they demonstrate the variety we would see in a, in, through a machine in a day from 12 kilos up to 40 kilos potentially, we see an enormous variation. And uh, obviously the machine's designed to take care of any varieties of the quantity of ribs in an animal. Some animals have 12 ribs, some have 13, some have 14. You want to make sure you're putting the cut in the right place to maximize the revenue and the highest value parts. Our machine does that automatically <coughs> through a machine learning process where we scan every animal. We know exactly where we need to cut it to get the best value. and. Uh, Deliver accurately. The advanced sensing also offers opportunity for um, when we do, we're in the process of doing some beef work, and as part of that, <coughs> the big value is going to come from having the um, ability to see the spine, see exactly where all those vertebrae are, where all the key points are, and know exactly where we cut to maintain the highest value in, in beef product. And so in terms of what we're working on, so the lamb boning room, we've got a number of other products we've been working on in the past and currently, the loin deboner, which takes the eye meat out of the loin automatically and the tenderloins out. 
That's a machine we've developed and is already commercial. We haven't yet integrated that with an automated boner room. That's one of the next steps. The um, beef automation I mentioned is a project that we're undertaking with the Australian industry right now. And we've already done a couple of years' work on that. And that will be something that we will have the first module available commercially within the next 18 months. So the top, the vision, the image on the top right, there is a is a concept of what we believe that automated lamb uh, beef boning is going to look like, and on the left is an image of the scanning we've done in terms of our prototyping. So we've CT product, we've actually taken that CT product back to our factory, installed it into a robot, and then the robot just cut it to that CT data, and then poultry automation. Um, not that it's relevant to a lot here, but. The video on the right, there is another innovation we've been doing in the US for um, pilgrims. That is uh, basically taking rotisserie chickens and taking the chicken, tying it up with string to constrain the wings and hocks for rotisserie chickens. They process about 1 billion chickens a year through rotisserie, so quite a big market. And uh, we're currently building the first two commercial machines for Costco, actually. and. Um, building another eight as well. So it's been a good innovation, but a good example of industry need and Scott delivering on a good um, technical solution. And that's all, thank you. Uh, so thanks, Andrew. So that's uh, a very rhythmic sector specific. Uh, view of, of what is happening. Now we're going to change tack a little bit and Bruce, you're going to give us uh, a, perhaps a slightly broader perspective of the potential for technology in, uh, in agriculture. Yeah, thank you and thanks for giving me a chance to talk. I'm going to talk about trends in automation and robotics. So I'll start and talk a little bit about our own work because just to give you a couple of examples and then a little bit about what's um, going on in New Zealand around that kind of area and then just make a few comments about some global trends. So our group's called CARES, which is a centre for automation and robotic engineering science, and it's a centre at the University of Auckland, where I am. And our goal is to make robots that help people, to focus on the people side, generally speaking. And the streams of work include, we've done a bit of work, and I'll talk about this today, a bit of work in, in agriculture, mainly horticulture, in robot companions and healthcare, and I'll show an example of that. Apart from that, how humans and robots work and interact together. So you don't see many robots in your life every day, but when, when there are a lot of them around, what will it be like is the question that we're interested in. Our, our team's a multidisciplinary team from all the different faculties at the university. And here's a video of a, our healthcare robot, most recent healthcare robot companion work for people with respiratory problems. This project is funded by the HRC as part of a partnership program and in innovation. And this particular project is looking at whether the robots can reduce hospitalizations in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a chronic lung condition. In this study we are recruiting 60 patients, so they're recruited from hospital, so after they've been in hospital for a COPD exacerbation. We recruit them and then we randomise them, so half of them get a robot to take home with them and half of them get standard care. This project is across both the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences as well as Middlemore Hospital and also with Faculty of Engineering. The technical challenge for us has been to put the software on the robot so that it does the functions it needs to do in interacting with people. And that's really taking uh, some kind of medical therapy and translating it in, so that it runs in software on the robot. Great, thank you for performing those tasks. There's a lot of things that have to kind of align. It's not just one bit of software like a game or something that has to integrate with the rest of the environment. So. That's quite a challenge um, and to get it robust enough. So those are the main challenges. Another one was connecting devices to the robot. So to do that, we need to hook a device up to the robot and program to talk to that device. And that shouldn't be challenging, but in practice actually it turns out to be more challenging than we expected because it's, it's quite hard to get devices that are open to 
us connecting up to them, so we've had to do quite a bit of work. Personally, I'm amazed at how well the robot is actually getting along with our patients. The patients have taken very well to the robot. They see them as an extra companion at home, uh, but in addition to being in a companion, it actually helps them check um, their health status, and then it gives us the connection as a health professional to monitor them at home. So the patient absolutely loves it. Please take two calls. When I actually got to use him and found out what he does, I was excited. It kind of changed my life. Quite often, older people who live alone are at greater risk of exacerbations. So we hope that these robots will reduce some of that isolation. He's very good company and he does remind me of a lot of things, mainly my medication. Let me know when you are ready to take that. He's on the ball for me all the time. One of the things that's different about this project is we really want to understand m more deeply about how people and robots interact. So in this study, the robots are with people for four months in their homes all the time, 24-7. And that's a long time for a sort of a research study and for us to analyse and record data. And we're getting some information about what happens when people get used to the robot have time to think about it and use it every day. Thank you for taking your medications. So we're hoping that through the functions on the robot, such as reminding people to take medication and reminding them to do their exercises, this is going to uh, prevent them from getting sicker. And also because the physiotherapist can monitor their symptoms over time, if she detects that there's something going wrong, she can intervene earlier before the patient gets so sick that they turn up at the emergency department and have to be admitted. We cannot replace uh, essential medical services. However, usually a um, patient who comes out of hospital, they would have standard care by physiotherapy regardless. So that include going back as an outpatient, participating in community-based uh, group classes to learn about physiotherapy management. So we're not taking away that at all. In fact, we're giving them a way to contact us additional to what they're getting um, and in hope that we would like to use this as a channel to educate our patient to continue the education that we start at the hospital in order for them to prevent um, readmission into the hospital. So that was the um, companion robot project. Before that we did a study at Selwyn Village in Auckland at Point Shed. We had 25 robots in the village and studied all the details about how people interact with them. It's generally fairly positive and the robots seem to help a bit. And that, that work has moved on to other things including some robots to help people with dementia, a bit of speech and language interaction, and currently a Maori sign language um, translation project which is going on at the moment. Uh, but with robots and children, and so on, and then we've ended up doing a bit of underwater robotics and a little bit of optimisation for carpet manufacturing. The other kind of main area we've worked in is horticulture robots, and the first project I'm going to talk about was a kiwi fruit project funded by MB in 2014, and we worked together with a partner, Robotics Plus, who had made the first version of the robot and wanted us to make f further versions and improve it for harvesting kiwi fruit and for pollinating kiwi fruit flowers. And that was, you know, largely driven by labour issues and the cost of pollen, because kiwi fruit um, pollen is quite expensive. And there's a, a video that's gonna, a couple of videos that will show that work.
there are cameras underneath looking up and they're trained with machine learning to find the kiwi fruit and tell the robot in 3D where to go and pick it. And the second video shows the robot platform and the um, kiwi fruit pollination which has got a, ban a bunch of nozzles and the cameras track the flowers and tell the nozzles when to shoot a small amount of pollen in the centre of each flower. So there's a kind of a real time requirement for that. The second horticulture project that we call is Maratek. It's about helping people do a better job of tasks in orchards and vineyards. Also driven when we talked to industry people and their 17 industry partners for this project, they told us it's not just the quantity of labour that we can get, it's the quality of the work that gets done. So this project is about helping people do a better job and also automating um, and the two key case studies are pruning grape vines and thinning apples. So the idea was, you can see um, this is a summary of the project, started in 2018. And you can see the idea is that the worker would wear a headset, an augmented reality headset, which would point to where they should prune vines or pick and remove ap um, small apples which were the things that the industry people wanted us to do. And then we would automate that with a robot as well. So there's a lot of machine vision, machine learning to understand the 3D nature of the plant and get the geometrical properties of it so we could then make decisions to do that. Again, that's a research program funded by MV. It's got uh, six research partners across the country. We try to get everybody to work together. I'll talk about that in a minute. And there's a there's a video that shows this. Just shows the platform that, that was built by one of our partners, which is the guys in Waikato. Waikato University. So it goes over the vine and goes down the road. And then the um, the other case study in that project was blueberry harvesting. It's turning out to be more challenging than we thought, but we're still working on some of the ways to do that, including a bit about maturity detection, which turns out is a problem in the industry anyway. Uh, for apple, apple thinning, the, the platform has to be higher, so this is an image of the higher version of that row, what you just saw. Uh, I haven't got a lot of time, so I'm going to just talk about the issue, the um, activities around New Zealand. So there's sort of two things going on. One is the National Science Challenge called SIFTI, or Science for Technological Innovation, has a theme which is, I don't know if you remember, National Science Challenges started about 10 years ago and they're about to finish. This was one of them. And there's a theme for sensors, robotics and automation, or robotics, automation and sensing, however you want to call it. There's a project there which is about making robots adaptable, and it's focused on um, forestry robotics at the moment, and currently they're trying to 
commercialise a robot that goes through the forest clearing tracks. They've done a few other things. There's a few things on the menu if you like. There's also a, um, a group, a networking group called Robotics Autom NZ Robotics Automation and Sensing, which is run by researchers around the country, all of the different groups. There, some of them are listed there that work on robotics, and we meet regularly to try and bring that together, and, and we want to work with industry people and work together to provide the expertise that is available. Uh, one example is the Waikato guys, Har Asparagus to Harvester, which has been shown in California and is maybe getting somewhere. In the industry, there's quite a few companies. We've heard from one of the key ones, from Andrew, from Scott Automation. The partner we worked with was Robotics Plus, and we transferred all that kiwi fruit stuff to them, and they're working on commercialising it um, at the moment. There's a bunch of other companies as well. I've tried to list some of them here. Um, Design Energy and Christchurch has installed hundreds of robots around the country. Uh, Can Do is an integrator in Auckland. Rockos was doing this stuff for, for managing swarms of robots. I recently got acquired by Drone Deploy. And there's a bunch of other companies around the place, especially in horticulture and quite a few integrators. And some of our team ended up um, working for Crown's Research and Development Centre in Auckland. Uh, what NZ RAS did was create a uh, road map, which is online if you want to see it, which identified some opportunities, quite a lot in New Zealand, especially around the primary sector. And some of the challenges, regulation is important. We need more diversity in our research base. We're working on that. It takes time though. If we talk about some of the trends, there's definitely much smarter software available now than there used to be. I mean, machine learning's been around for a few years, a decade or something, but before that it wasn't really that much useful, but now it is. Uh, language interaction, of course, is a big thing. Robotic process automation is very common, uh, but it's not a robot, it's just automating what you do um, on the key, um, computer. There's more interaction between robots and humans, so there's a big business in selling robots and people, they call them cobots, because they're designed to work with humans and meet safety regulations and so on. And there's an increasing amount of automation. During COVID, there was an uplift in um, automation technology used around the world. Generally speaking, when there's an economic dive, robots do better than other machinery in terms of sales. If you look at the International Federation of Robotics reports, there is a robot butcher project, which is an EU project uh, funded, in, funded in Europe, of course. Um, one thing to remember, though, is that what you see in movies, most of what you see on television and science fiction, is exactly that, it's fiction. It's got no relationship to the real world at all, as far as we can see. And um, most of the purpose for robotics and automation is to improve productivity, of course. But energy and sustainability will be more important as time goes on. And safety's been important in that area forever and will continue to be ever since a Japanese worker was squashed by a robot in the 60s. Skilled staff's going to be crucial if you want to use automation. We need to have more skilled staff, more of them and more skilled, I think. And we need to think about how automation can help with climate change, sustainability, mental health, and all the sustainable development goals. But one of the key things to remember is that robots are not going to take all our jobs. Most of what you hear about that is nonsense and robots won't take over the world and kill us all because they're just not good enough to do that yet. Uh, there's a few cautions though. Rodney Brooks is a very famous researcher and um, innovator in uh, making companies. And he reminds us that all of this stuff takes a lot longer than anybody ever thinks it's going to take to get it into the field and used at scale. A European report pointed out that you don't need to fear the robots because Labour has been racing with the machine more than against the machine. It's not a competition, we're in, the, in, the, in it together. The other thing that I wanted to say was be careful about the hype. If you, if you listen to a lot of companies, they don't know what AI is or what chat GPT is or whatever, they don't know whether it's a risk, they don't know what the benefits are, but they want it in everything uh, right now. So I think you should try to avoid that kind of thinking. Anyway, that's me, thank you for listening.
Oddly, there was a couple of things that stood out for me. The firm swarm of robots, and then that bit at the end where you said uh, you added yet. So the, uh, don't be fearful of the robots taking over the world and killing them. Uh, I'd prefer if you left the yet out of that conversation. <laughs> but anyway, look, we're going to hit you with, um, with a couple of questions. Uh, look, we're certainly getting a sense of how important uh, technology is and the potential for technology, uh, but it's moving really quickly. So how does New Zealand, how does New Zealand agriculture stay abreast of what's happening from a global perspective? I'll take an answer from either of you. We have to do things like this, we have to do it. And we have to keep up, which means doing executing it. It's like they say, you know, a, a strategy or a plan or that execution is really just a dream. But you've got to get past that and actually do it. And I think if you do that, people will come and work with you and they'll come to the country. I think looking at the world today, a lot of people, if we keep things going well, will want to come to New Zealand and get a lot of people want to study, want to get jobs here. It's just a matter of accommodating them. I think it's also, <coughs> when you consider the investment required to develop technology like we're talking about from the industry, a lot of the support came from, for our, our development came from Australia and um, through Meat and Lifestyle Australia and ANPC. And there's no equivalent investment portfolio, if you like, from the New Zealand side for what we did. We did get some support way back from NZTE, but that's sort of dried up since. And uh, I think the investment required is so large, no one processor can afford to do it themselves. They, it requires some support. Okay, so hold, hold that thought, we'll come back to that. Um, Chris mentioned this morning some, some really specific uh, potential barriers uh, to technology adoption in the meat industry in Australia, things like uh, wrong side of the world, small fish in a big pond, just talked a little bit about resource limitations. Do you see anything specifically from a New Zealand perspective that is holding us back? Anything additional from, in terms of adoption of technology or development and adoption? For me, it's about working together. That's what NZRES is trying to do, is get the researchers to work together. Because if you don't do that, they end up competing with each other, and then you get duplication of the same thing, which is you know, it's just a waste of resources. So working together, and partnering with other people, I think. So ideally, researchers and industry working together more than they are would be better, I think. I think New Zealand's got really clever people. We're innovative, and um, and I actually think we lead the way in many respects in terms of meat processing automation. What we're doing in land, Scott is doing in land, and through the industry in Australia and New Zealand, is leading edge. There's nothing in the bone rooms around the world that I've seen that goes anywhere near what we've done. I think there's some, there's some slaughterboard automation in port that's um, is very clever um, and probably leads the way in terms of slaughterboard automation. But um, in terms of how we lead, well, I, th I think New Zealand and um, the industry here has the potential to lead the way in terms of technology. And being remote in some respects could be an advantage. Yeah, very good. Uh, we've got a question from the floor. Grant Bunting from Ansco promised me an intelligent question, which um, I'm not sure if this is yours, Grant, but we'll run with it and you can, you can take the credit because it's anonymous. Um, how many of the challenges are unique to New Zealand and is it okay to be a technology adopter um, versus developing that technology specifically in New Zealand? Um, the, te the technological challenges are the same globally as far as I can see. I mean, you've got naturally varying product, you've got to control the product, you've got to cut it to give the maximise the yields, and to keep people safe. It's the same wherever you are in the world, in my mind. Um, yeah, I agree. And I think we do need to be innovating our own new technology. If we don't do that, we won't know how to use the technology from overseas properly. You won't understand it and put it to use in a logical way. Okay, another one from the floor. A lot of the automation uh, development focuses on high throughput and volume. How do we right size this for New Zealand relevant solutions that are cost effective to implement? Great question. And actually, if you look at, I keep coming back to our product, but 
our lamb bone automation, we've designed them in a way that it's modular, and so you can have a, the large processors can process the, the 10 a minute, the high volume, high throughput plants. But all those modules are able to be standalone and designed and suited to a smaller plant as well. So we've got all that, and um, that's evolving from our point of view. I think, uh, I think the problem generally is that, <coughs> pardon me, the problem generally is the cost of developing this stuff is so high that um, the smaller plants struggle with investment in particular areas of automation that they might like. Um, and that's where you sort of need to leverage off the bigger plants and the technology developed to help support them as well. Okay. We've talked a lot about uh, technology obviously, uh, in some respects, obviously supporting the labour force in the red meat sector, but also compensating in some areas for a lack of labour. How are you guys finding it in terms of uh, attracting the capability to do what you need to do in your organisations? Is it a challenge? Yes. It is. No, we've had, it's been very difficult the last few years <coughs> um, attracting high calibre staff to our business has just been very competitive. And, um, We've struggled throughout the business, not just high calibre in terms of design engineers and controls engineers, but also fitters and workshop staff. It's a very competitive landscape. And Bruce, perhaps you're, you've got a role to play in terms of that pipeline of very clever people. How are you finding it? Uh, well, we, had, we didn't get as many international students, for example, during the COVID um, period, but now that's coming back. I think people are genuinely encouraging it. We need quite a lot more. My understanding is that the IT sector was hiring 70% of their new staff from overseas before COVID. So when that pipeline got chopped off, it's no wonder that we now have a shortage of those people in a lot of jobs and a lot of churn in that job market because now everybody's stealing everyone else's advanced skills, skilled staff. So we, we need more and it's a bit disappointing to see, you know, un some universities are cutting back on their staff because I think in two or three years they'll be desperate to hire more staff because that, those student numbers in that pipeline will increase. We did get a, a, a boost in the, in the number of domestic students studying um, in a couple of years ago, so that seems to be strong, but we need to do more, we need to get more. In, in engineering we still need more people, there's not even enough kids do physics in school to become qualified to do that. So. The STEM outreach, um, you know, program needs to be as strong as we can make it. I think to encourage people to get involved. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions uh, coming in now, which is great. Um, so there's obviously a reasonable amount of collaboration between Australia and New Zealand. Uh, that has been beneficial. Should we be doing more of that? Is there an opportunity to do more of that? Definitely. The Australian industry is just as important to Scott as New Zealand in terms of um, opportunity. Um, the, the development work we're doing in beef is very much driven through the Australian industry. Um, so our collaboration there is essential to the future of developing that. Yeah. Uh, for the processes in the room, there's a couple of questions here about collaboration within New Zealand. So Andrew, you're probably best to comment on that from a meat industry perspective. How, how well developed, how mature is the, the collaboration within the New Zealand industry between the processes? Um, I think it's changed over the last 20 years actually since I when I first got involved in the meat industry in 2001 or whatever it was I think, I think it was 2000, but when we first started in the meat industry, meat companies weren't talking to each other, they didn't want to know each other, there was very little opportunity for people to go through their various plants. And that's changed over recent years. I think there's still an element of um, competitive friction there, obviously. But when it comes to technology, I think people are more open to sharing opportunity. Um, when it comes to Australia, I, I th we've been involved in a number of uh, events where we've taken people across to the Australian industry and to have a look at what we've done there, but also show them the um, competitive plans. So I think the collaboration's actually improved a lot in recent times. Yeah, it's great to hear. Uh, Bruce, I'm going to give this one to you. This one's a tricky one. Uh, how do we strike a balance between AI and human labour? 
do we strike a balance? Well, it's not clear to me we need a balance because I don't, the AI is not going to take people's jobs. There's no evidence for it, but you can see. And there's more jobs, more people employed in the world than there have been over the whole history of all time. I mean, and if you go back and look at the re reservations people have, you can go back to the introduction of the printing press when everybody worried that monks would be out of a job because they were, before the printing press, they were copying books by hand, but that didn't do them out of a job. Uh, when we introduced um, banking machines, ATM machines around the US, they ended up being more bank tellers employed than there were beforehand because bank tellers didn't need to count and dispense cash that was done by the machine and that bank tellers could spend time making a relationship with their clients. So banks opened more branches than before. Of course, when they went, did everything on the internet, then that trend reversed. But, you know, it's not the case that it has to be a competition. I think we should be trying, firstly, to make AI work with people, not compete with them, because there's no need to compete with them. And secondly, there will be people displaced from jobs, but our job is to use the technology to help those people, you know, come along with the game, get another job or be involved in, you know, um, looking after maintaining and operating the machines like that, that Andrew and his colleagues are, are, are installing. Thank you. Is there, is there one thing that you think, and particularly thinking about it from the perspective of New Zealand agriculture, you can hone in on the red meat sector if you like, but is there one thing that you think we could do differently as a country to really accelerate the opportunity or the opportunities that technology provides? Is there one thing we could do differently? For me, it will be try harder to work together as one team. Because, I mean, you know, people say this quite a bit, actually, that New Zealand's about the size of a big city in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. And in a big city, there would be lots of companies, lots of businesses, and several universities, and they would all work together on the, the big problems. So we just need to have an attitude that we're going to do that. We're not going to compete with each other. We're going to work as a team and, and work and, and, and make the government help us. Yeah. Andrew? For me, it's uh, the investment support. I mean, a lot of the developments we've been doing has been with the Australian industry, supported by the Australian industry, and I don't think that is evident in New Zealand at all. And um, to, to transform how we go about this automation, it requires a reasonably substantial investment, like I said earlier, <coughs> and I believe the government should be supporting it. Okay. Bruce, I, th I thought, uh, and we've, there are a few questions around funding, so I think uh, you've, you've touched on funding. Thanks, Andrew. Bruce, I thought you might get this one. Um, you did talk a lot about horticulture innovations. Um, was, is there a reason why you're seeing more innovation perhaps deployed in horticulture than the red meat sector, for, for example? I don't think there's a particular reason. The reason why I talked about that is because that's what we've done. And that happened, um, it's a bit strategic. Um, our university developed a, a agritech strategy which was to partner with people and two of our people went round the industry forming relationships and then one of them came back and said oh we want to do uh, kiwi fruit harvesting can you do that so we applied to the government who funded that project and, and that way that went and the second project kind of stepped on, on, on from as the next steps on that so really it's about just getting together and, like I was saying, working together, I think, yeah. Okay. Andrew, how does Scott go about identifying the next key opportunity? Oh, we've got a strategic roadmap which identifies where we're headed with the meat industry generally, so it's very clear in our minds now what we're going to be doing in the next five years. So it comes back to we target areas of the meat industry where the value isn't about the start, um, it's not just about labour, it's about adding value to the product and to the um, industry. And it, so that the payback is justifiable for our customers and that uh, we hit the mark in terms of being able to develop a machine that can, um, let's say, add value. Okay, one more question, Mike. He's, uh, he's hidden behind the corner with uh, Gesticulating wildly when you can't see him. Um, What's the next big thing? 
What's, what's, so the last question, what's the next big thing in technology that the New Zealand red meat sector should be considering, should be keeping an eye on globally? Beef or boning automation. Beef boning automation, yeah. Bruce, from a broader perspective? I have no idea. I mean, I think um, <laughs> growing meat in the lab is something we should be thinking about. Because you know you could automate that. Well, that's a happy thing to end on. <laughs> 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 hey, look, to be honest, it's, it's reality, right? We know that that's happening around the world, so we might as well understand that we need to be best at it. That's the, that's the point. Right? We need to be the best. And we know about meat, so why wouldn't we be the best at it? Good point. Excellent. Hey, thank you very much, team. It was a wonderful deep dive and uh, into innovation and technology. So, look, thank you very much to all of you um, <clears throat> now for an interesting session. Um, well done to Stu for facilitating that beautifully, so what excellent work, um, obviously built in the early days in Ansco Foods maybe, but um, nice to see you uh, do that for us, so thank you very much. So a gift from Wilson Hallaby to all three of you, um, this, this won't be product that's come from Cultured Meat Bruce, but this will be the real livestock sector, but um, thank you very much again, and, and uh, again we look forward to catching up with you over the lunch.